वेलकम बैक टू अनदर पॉडकास्ट ऑन द टेक कैचअप शो नट फॉर टेक ओरिजिनल्स टुडे वी हैव मिस्टर डगलस हावत लीडिंग ऑथर इन बिजनेस एनालिटिक्स एंड सीईओ ऑफ एमई इनकॉर्पोरेशन हेलो सर थैंक यू फॉर जॉइनिंग अस टुडे थैंक यू वेरी मच फॉर हैविंग मी कनेश आई अप्रिशिएट द टाइम थैंक यू सर सो सर लेट्स स्टार्ट विद योर इंट्रोडक्शन यू कैन इंट्रोड्यूस योरसेल्फ टू आवर ऑडियंस ओके अम अगेन माय नेम इज डग हावत डगलस हावत आई एम अम currently the head of me inc as the logo shows right here and our company has discovered how to plot in four dimensions so we've made a discovery to show how to plot in four or more dimensions and then we've created an invention some software that helps display that and with that we can analyze any market ranging from ground beef to trains to spaceships which we've done and um using that we can figure out um where people can enter markets or if they're already in the markets we can figure out how to make help them make more money so that's that's kind of what we do and the, awesome. the way we do that is it turns out that markets have some self organized self organizing features that we discover and that's what we show our clients how to do is how to discover how the markets organize themselves got it that's pretty interesting stuff right uh, we'd like to go in deep into uh, some time at the podcast in the middle of podcast yeah. Okay. Uh, so I like to start from the time when you did your bachelor's from Washington State University in economics. Am I right? Yes, right. Yes, It's... I was there in the. Uh, I'm carbon dating myself. I was there in the in the mid to late '70s, and uh, and was part of the honors program. And our, our the head of our honors program was uh, Dr. Vishnu Bacha, and um, he put us through a very rigorous program, and it uh, made us. exposed to a variety of different uh techniques and thinking and uh, i've kind of taken that thinking and then i went into aerospace i worked briefly for Bo- the boeing company up in uh, seattle for about a year and a half and then i worked for the skunk works the uh, branch of the lockheed martin company that is their high tech uh portion of the company the company that uh that works out all the brand new airplanes and and missiles and the like that help uh, defend America. So it it was a very exciting time there. And just as I got to my end of my career there, I figured out how to plot in four dimensions. So I uh I quit there and and started my own firm so I could show people how to do that. That's great. So so you spent around uh, close to 31 years at Lock uh, Lockheed yes. Martin, right? So uh, Right, yes. from the time when you just joined uh, which of uh, up the ladder which position you hold at lockheed martin uh, if you can tell us about that the way okay. you joined and to the yeah. way you left the company right at that point well i i started out in their um in their um on their production floor i was help, helping to run the um so some of the um moving the parts around in the company and then eventually i became the program manager for the 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 manufacturing program manager for their F117A stealth bomber or stealth fighter rather you remember if you heard about they eventually migrated into what they called parametric estimating yeah. which is where they figure out what the cost is of uh, the cost is going to be of various projects they were trying to work on then i figured out that the uh, the cost was only part of what they needed to address there was there were some other elements like what was the value of what they were building and then what the demand was for what they were building and so i worked out that and that's what made me think for my own company but I, i had a great time there there were some very interesting people there some of the most uh, interesting people my mentors are from there and um, they had some really great people there that's great so really come to mentors at the last point of time on a podcast uh, so i also see that you worked on uh, around 11 research papers right yeah actually it's up to 14 now yes so, so so some of them are entitled um one of the most recent ones i gave was entitled a 7d trade so i worked out how to tr- to do uh, analysis in seven dimensions and then i've uh worked on ways to do what we call financial cat scans which is actually like a a human cat scan that yeah. takes section cuts of the market to, and then it basically takes a four dimensional system translates it to three dimensions and then two dimensional section cuts and then comes up with one dimensional answers to figure out where to go where to put a product in a market call it and i did that with time so that ended up being uh, financial cat scans in time i've um given papers in on four continents um Europe 
South America, North America, and Australia. That's great, sir. That's, that's yeah. pretty awesome stuff. And yeah. uh, I think this is the, uh, you have also been a part of the world's first software designed to break market down into, uh, I guess, four primary di uh, dimensions, right? Yes, exactly. Yes. So can you tell us uh, how you got the idea or how you started? I see there, there were some uh, uh, team members of yours, right, with you in this yes. particular project. So how you came down to this particular idea? Was it during a lunch time or something like that? It was uh, pretty interesting. It was a uh, interesting origin story. I was out with my wife buying a uh, washing machine of all things. We needed to buy a new washing machine, a new dryer. And so I walked into the store and, um, you know, maybe I run, walked underneath a, a black refrigerator and looked up and kind of saw a couple of lights go over the top of this monolithic structure and kind of had a, uh, a moment kind of like from, um, you know, a long time, a movie a long time ago where, you know, you're just looking up and like a primitive man and seeing these, these two lights up above you. And it kind of, it, it struck me that, that, what, that, that my wife, when we started listening to her, she was, she was trying to buy the, the washing machine based on its features. And I'd done a lot of work on cost before. And so um, that movie, by the way, had been 2001 a Space Odyssey, where the primitive man looks up at the monolith and sees the, two, the moon and the sun line up above it. And so I saw a refrigerator on the way in, and it made me think about that. It made me think about all the times I've been trying to work out a problem like this. And so I see my wife is buying a washing machine. And she says, well, I like this washing machine because it's got more capacity than the other washing machine we have. And I say, capacity, I go, well, I can make that a continuous variable. That's, you know, different sizes. Yeah. And then she says, you know, I'd like to have more cycles too, if I could. The cycles, well, it's an integer, but you know, like it's, it's, you can treat it like a continuous variable. Yeah. And she says, um, and I, I, the washing machine we have now, I have to bend over, you know, now we could, they come with a pedestal now. And so we could actually come up and you don't have to bend over to get the yeah. laundry. And I said, well, that's a step function with a literal step in it. Yeah. And so I'm, I'm seeing her juggle all these variables in her, in her head. And then she says, I asked her, I said, well, what it, so we, had, we found a model we liked. And I said, well, what about the next one up? He says, well, it's too expensive. We can't afford it. Yeah. And then I realized she's juggling all these variables in her head. And I, I thought, well, all the value variables are making the thing, the, the price go up, the, the capacity and the cycles and, and um, you know, the drying times and everything like that. That's all something that made the value go up. But at the same time, the, the, the price was going to make the demand go down. You yeah. know, the, more, the higher the cost to us, the fewer products that were going to be sold. And so then that's when I saw this four dimensional system appear before me. True. And that's what set me off on this is I, I went home and I basically sketched this out and been working on this for over a decade since then. So. Oh my God, over a decade. Yeah. That's, that's pretty hectic. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that's awesome. So uh, I saw that you did uh, some uh, great deal of work in uh, cost analysis, right? Cost analysis. Yes, right. For, Lo for Lockheed Martin, and uh, what they want us to do is to figure out what we did for their parametric section. I headed up the, the Skunk Works parametric estimators. And what we had to do was figure out the, the cost of things that had never been built before because we wanted to see if the government could afford it. So we would work out the cost from everything from a, um, worked out everything from a one inch long single bladed rocket powered helicopter. Yeah. To the, what would have been the world's largest um, flying object, we worked out the, the price for a, a uh, lighter than air ship, partially buoyant airship that would have been 300 and some feet long. And um, so it worked from the very small to the massive and from um, stuff that was on the ground into stuff that went into space. So it was really a fascinating, fascinating position. It kind of opened up my mind to all the possibilities of what's possible out there. Uh, so kind of you, uh, kind of you currently, you have a mix of economics and analytics mixed into your current career, right? Yes, yes, right, right. Uh, so analytics was something that you uh, were taught in your uh, bachelor's or it you yes. later in your experiences? Well, both. I, I, I got some of it from my, my schooling. And um, I, I remember seeing when, when, when I was a little kid, you know, I was 13, 14, I, I saw Rene Descartes' 
three-dimensional system, you know, up, down, left, right, in and out. And I said, I like that. I mean, it explains space, but what does it do for things that aren't related to space? Like a market isn't related to space. You know, the price, we show it going up and down like it's, like it's vertical, but price doesn't really relate to physical space. And so I, I, I always had this thing in the background of like, well, how do markets relate to physical, physical space? And they have a, an analogy, but it's not a direct analogy. And that's what's interesting about it is you can make some analogies where you need to, and then you can separate yourself from it when you have to. And that's, this that's was kind of, at the age of 13, right? Yes, 13, yeah. I just watched watch cartoon at that point of time. <laughs> <laughs> but you were taking out, you were taking pre-algebra and stuff like that. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Uh, uh, so currently, you you started ME, right? Uh, it's been around yes. 13 years, I guess. Uh, you're currently the, yes. currently mm-hmm. the CEO. Uh, right. So uh, you served some Fortune 500 companies as well. So how... Yes. If you can explain your experience at ME, how you started and currently where you are. Well, uh, physically, we're in we're in Southern California, about 25 miles north of Los Angeles. And uh, we have um, people that work for us that are in Texas and Wisconsin. We've had another we've had contractors that work for us that are in Sweden and uh, other places. And um We've worked for Lockheed Martin Space Systems, uh, Lockheed Martin Aero, where they, the helicopter division, Sikorsky, and we've worked for Raytheon, Northrop Grumman, United Technologies, and then we've worked for smaller companies. So down the street, we, we did some an analyst analysis of a uh, restaurant, and we discovered that it's seating. You know, we have COVID, like you have COVID now, and, and what they're doing out here is they, they force people to go outside to have outdoor seating for, for restaurants. Yeah. And they had a certain seating arrangement that they were trying to increase capacity. So they had lots of big tables out there in the back. And I, I had done some, you know, I've been going to this restaurant for a while and we did, we had done some analytics about how restaurant parties are formed. And it worked out that Worldwide, there's more than twice as many two-party or two-party groups as four-party groups for restaurants, and so they had switched around the the ratio of the big tables to the small tables. Mm-hmm. And so what I told them to do was to make more small tables and fewer big tables, and that took the revenue up over twenty-five percent in a month. True. So, mm-hmm. Yeah. So that's that's kind of what we do there, and then we also helped out a um, a company that's fighting fires we we figured out that a, a this russian plane that, that that this company wanted to bring in would actually be a really good deal for the forest service so we we work for this this other uh, firm that fights fires so we we've, yeah, we've had a lot of a lot of different things i read some testimonials on your website right regarding yes. that. Uh, yeah so uh, yeah modern workspaces also are kind of this the this particular issue of space right it's uh, arising day by day Oh yes, that that's kind of what we're trying to solve with that is what how do you optimize the space? Yes, right. And and that in a restaurant it's particularly important to get that right. So, so is it work from home or you are working from the office? Well, we're all working from home now. I mean, I think that's a you know that's kind of the world way of doing things. We're we're gonna you know reestablish an office here. I think once COVID breaks, but um, you know right now we're we're working from home. So yeah. So how big is your team? Uh, we have uh, between five and 10 people working for us, um, uh, depending on what the projects are. I think we've been up to maybe 10 or 11 a couple of times. We're just trying to get uh, people aware of what it is that we do. So um, it, this is a new way of thinking. And um, it's hard to get some people to understand that the, the, the old way of thinking was limiting in some many ways. And so what we, we've discovered is that um, we can show people how to do more with uh, the, what they have if they, if they use our techniques, but a lot of people are rooted in the past. It's, it's kind of like, um, like when people wanted to go from a, an Earth-centered universe to a Sun-centered universe. Not everybody wanted to believe that that was what was happening. I mean, it looks like the, everything's spinning around the Earth, yeah. but of course, that's not what's going on, but it's, it's a matter of perspective. So th- this is trying to change people's perspectives. So we're, we're trying to grow right now by, by doing that. I've got a, 
book that's awaiting publication, but I've been told that uh, I need to have more media exposure. So I'm, you know, I'm trying to get that to get to get more to get the be able to have the book be able to be published. So great. So I think yeah. I, our podcast might help in that. <laughs> yeah, I think so. That's one of the reasons for wanting to be on, quite frankly. So during COVID, what does your typical day look like? Uh, well, we. Uh, we are courting a couple of clients, and so we're we're trying to get data ready for these clients to show show them how we can um, help them. We have one potentially very large client that's in the energy sector, so we're doing stuff there. And so we'll do studies to to either prove or disprove the the theories that they have. So if you wanted to say, for example, prove that clean energy is good, which I think we all know is good, you, you might want to go out and see, well, are people paying more for clean energy now than, than uh, dirty energy? And it turns out, excuse me, my, my battery's running down. No, no, no. It turns out that you can actually find out and plot that uh, people are paying more for clean energy, right? Clean energy or for electric car horsepower than they are for... Um, gasoline horsepower. And so that, that actually is, that's a study that you can, you can do if you go out and find the data. So we try to acquire the data and then see how the data is arranged and then see what kind of conclusions we can draw from that. And then we try to convince people to, you know, to hire us to prove that to other people or to figure out what they need to do for themselves. And so, for example, that forest fighting company, they wanted to, fi they, they had the idea that their plane that they wanted to bring in would it help the United States fight forest fires more efficient, more efficiently? And it turns out that when you have, it was going to be a jet, it's a jet powered, what they call a super scooper. It was going to, it's got a couple of jets, jet engines mounted on the top of the fuselage. It's going to come in and hit the water, scoop up water and then drop it. Okay. And it can make more cycles than other propeller planes can. Sure. And it's only slightly more expensive. So it turns out on a per drop basis, it's actually very, very efficient. And, but you had it, we had to be able to get the data to prove that to the Forest Service and the U.S. Senate. And they, uh, they liked that. And they sent the data to the State Department. And then it went back to Russian officials. And the Russian officials agreed. And they signed a deal with um, the Airbus Corporation to build the uh, plane under license to the Russians, build it in the West. And... Um, the only thing that's holding that up is that little war that they have between U U Ukraine and Russia right now. It's kind of slowing it down a little bit. I, I personally worked on a small project related to forest fire, right? the burnt area mapping or something. It's a very small project, right? But it's, it's a fascinating topic, isn't it? Yeah, true. With yeah, Amazon fire and Australian fire, right? Or the, oh, yes, right. That's a, that was massive. That's a massive problem. Oh, that's great. So, uh, so COVID has kind of, uh, some people have got advantage from COVID, uh, not personally, but in, you could say in work life, right? Some companies have become more efficient during mm -hmm. COVID. Yes. So what has COVID brought for you, for your company? Right. Well, um, we've had to become more efficient too. We, we can't go out and meet with the clients. The, the, the one thing that's interesting about what our stuff does, uh, just to, Give you an example. This is the um, this is the uh, a, a 4D model of the stock market right here. Yeah. So can you so just, on, yeah. It's, yeah. So what we're finding over here is on the on, on this green side, we're comparing the rate of return for 30 stocks in the Dow Dow 30 on their earnings per share, and then on their return on investment. And between the Every one of these dots represents one of the 30 stocks in the market. And between the return on investment and the earnings per share, there's a, a, a surface that describes that. Cool. And every point here has got a matching point over here on the, on the demand plane. Yeah. And it turns out that, that some people are very visual learners and they can, they can see a picture of this and they can understand it. The problem we have is that some people are are tactile learners. They actually want to touch something like this and they can touch it. So one of the things that's happened with us with COVID is we can't get, we can't have this stuff go to, we can't explain in person how this works to the tactile learners. The tactile learners, we, we may have to ship it to them and have them assemble it so that they can actually touch it. So these, th these pieces dis dis disassemble. So this, this piece here, um, 
this basically just assembles into this. So yeah. here, the, well, here's what we're studying here. We're studying 30 stocks and here's, four, you know, here, so here's four of the 30 stocks and we're looking at their volume, their mm -hmm. uh, earnings per share, return on investment and price. And so these points along the top here are, are the, um, are Boeing, Microsoft, Apple, and Pfizer. Yeah, Pfizer. Pfizer is kind of. <laughs> right. That was. This is from. You see, this is from nineteen, and so this is, this is from about a year and a half ago. So you yeah. see, Pfizer was actually a pretty good deal then. Yeah. And then we we actually look at the. This is the return on assets relative to the value, sure. for each of those stocks, and then this would be the. Um, earnings per share from these stocks. And so everybody understands this stuff by itself, but what we discovered is that you can assemble it into this. And that's, that's, the, that's the advantage then. And so it, it, then it's the case that if you get the stocks below this plane, maybe underpriced. Underpriced, yeah. Yes, now there may be other, other elements you want to put in there, but items below the plane may be underpriced and items above the plane may be overpriced. Overpriced, right. Yes. So the, the other thing it does is if you, if you do this for electric cars, electric. this is the electric car market, yeah. it, is it creates a, it ends up creating a map for you of the uh, electric, of a market. So um, in this case, this is the electric car market in 2013. And if you look at this, there's a certain range, there's a return for range. So range is here. I'm sorry, range is here, right there. The range is here, range. Yeah. range, yeah. I'm sorry, and then um, is the quantity over here is the, the um, horsepower. Yeah, horsepower. And so this surface here describes the, the return for horsepower and range in electric cars in 2013. And then you see there's this big open space in the, here in the middle. Yeah. Well, that use, this, is, this turns into a map that tells you what, what you can do uh, with no little or no competition. So if you wanted to build something in the middle of this space, then you don't have any competition. That's what that does for you. Great market opportunity, right? That's the gap in the market. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what that's trying to do. Is trying to trying to make those kind of explanations for you. So that that's what we're trying to do is to give people the insight for the, for that. And we can build this. That's a 4D model built on a 3D printer. Yeah. That's a sample that you know in two D planes that you can hold in one hand. So that that's kind of what our little one of our, our features there is that you can do that kind of analysis. That that is pretty interesting stuff, right? So so but uh, as in you could say if you are explaining all this to an amateur, right? So how much uh, what is your tactic, or you could say what is your style of making them understand what you are saying, right? Because when numbers comes to a normal person. He might get yes. confused. And how do you make sure that uh, the thing that you are explaining uh, reaches to your client? Right? Yeah, well, we, we would say that, you know, markets can, can seem confusing and, and um, it, it's hard to describe them maybe in a way that you can see what, like how the astronomers describe where the stars are. And what, we're, but what astronomers do is they, they see these points and they try to find a relationship in those points and so what we do is we, we figure out how these, these things, how the markets organize themselves and we figure out what's, what's undervalued and what's overvalued. So um, if you have a really something that seems like it's a really good deal, you, what, what this will do is it'll figure out if it is a really good deal. And if it's a really good deal, you should, you maybe should buy it. Like if it's a stock and, and the price will go up. Yeah. So the idea here is to find things that are for existing products is to find things that are over or underpriced and sell it, correct the price so that you can make more money. So the other thing that could happen here for a government is in the United States, they're trying to legal, they've legalized marijuana in certain places. Yeah. And so what's the right tax to put on marijuana so you can make as much money as you, as you could possibly make on it. It might seem like you want to make a really high tax, but it turns out that if the the math has got if, if the demand is pretty as they call it flat, a flat a really high tax will drive all the stuff into the black market, and it works out that that happens. And so, 
the way we explain it to somebody in a simple way is that it, it figures out how people organize and it tries to take advantage, it tries to describe that and then take advantage of the, the way that they organize and, and, and abide by the way that they organize. Because there's also limits to what the market forms and you don't want to try to exceed a limit of what the market has. So that's, that's what we try to do. So it's trying to just basically see the way the world, the way, the way the rest of the world sees it, so that you can, um, you can figure out how to find your place, you know, in a market and then thrive in that market. That, that would be the way we try to explain it. So you have worked with a lot of clients, right? You have solved different kinds of problems, not in a, per, <laughs> in a particular industry. So which was the most challenging industry that you face or problem, if any specific you might share with us? Um, well, we've, a lot of the stuff we've done is, um, is classified, but I, I'd say the, um, the most interesting problem that I could tell you about that's, that's relatable is that, that restaurant problem. Again, that restaurant yeah. is right down the street from us. We go to this restaurant all the time and you go to a restaurant and you say, ah, yeah, they've got people in it. They, they must be fine. Right. Yeah. But what if it could be more fine? And so what we studied was, is, is it really does work out that for every two party, for every four party group that you have at a restaurant, there's two and a, two and a quarter of many, as many two party people there. Good. So what you want to make sure is that you've got the right ratio of tables to the parties that are going to come in. And so if you don't, if you had that mismatch, that was a mismatch that we found. If that's mismatch, you're not going to have as much income would be the, the theory. And so we, we, we knew the manager there. We talked to her and we said, look, we're pretty certain that your, the way your tables are arranged here <clears throat> is not working out for you. You've got a lot of two party people sitting at six party tables. And you've got people in the, sitting outside trying to get in, they can't get in. So get rid of the six part, you know, drop a couple of the six party tables, put in some more two party tables and your revenue will go up. And it, it, it did. So that was very, very satisfying because this place that we go to all the time, you can see the results, you know, in, in a month. So uh, it was very exciting. In a month. It's always awesome when you can see the results in an instant, or you could say, and whether yeah. place where you personally go, right, you're making an impact yeah. in, your, in someone who you are visiting personally, right? So that's something. Yeah, because so yeah, this restaurant uh, manager of my, we're, she's a friend of ours. And so when we did this, she was excited. We were excited and the place is still, still running right now. So that, that was very exciting. It's very great. satisfying. <clears throat> so, so moving on to the last uh, part of our podcast, right? So okay. I'd like to ask you, uh, what are, who are the people who made significant contribution to your life? Uh, uh, maybe your mentors, friends, family, if you can mention some. Oh, sure. There, there's about, I, I can think of three people that had a, a very big impact. Um, I had a, uh, uh, Mr. Erickson, when I was in high school, he was my math teacher. He was, uh, he was a great guy. He really got me interested in mathematics very deeply. So um, Jim Erickson, I hope he's still alive. I don't know. And then two people from Lockheed. One's the chief scientist, Dr. Ned Allen. When I was telling you about that single powered, that single bladed rocket powered helicopter, yeah, that was his invention. He came up with that invention. You can actually look that up on the internet. Somebody made a, a, a bigger version of it that actually does fly. Okay. Sounds like it's a science fiction, but he's, it's got a rocket powered tip and it, it just flops around like a maple seed. And he's a brilliant mathematician out of Penn and I really enjoyed talking to him. And then one of my best friends is Dr. Paul Bevilacqua. Dr. Paul Bevilacqua is not very well known, but he's the guy that invented the lift band system for the F-35 um, fighter jet. And that ended up getting Lockheed the lar potentially the largest contract ever written. It's going to be worth between one and three trillion with a T, three trillion dollars. And he had that, that moment of insight. He said he, it, the, his moment of insight came in the shower after he'd been working on a problem for decades. All of a sudden, in five minutes, he came up with the idea. Kind of like me being in the, uh, in the, in the, in the store with my wife, watching her buy a washing machine. Yeah. Those, those three people had a terrific Im impact on my life. And I, I love all of them. They're great people. So. Great. So, sir, uh, uh, this will be the last part. Uh, 
this is in tradition uh, that we follow at nerd for tech where we ask yeah. the speakers to recommend some of the books or you could say blogs articles um, maybe newsletters that you personally follow and that might help someone yeah i i follow a couple of podcasts that i like a lot there's um answers with joe answers with joe with joe scott okay he's an actor and he's a filmmaker he actually portrays himself in a, in a couple of his videos. In fact, sometimes he plays two characters, two versions of himself talking. Yeah. He talks about everything from um, quantum mechanics to super volcanoes to money. It's, he's a really interesting uh, guy. And then there's a Brit called Thoughty, Thoughty 2. It's a kind of a, a play on 42 from um, Douglas Adams, you know, the restaurant at the end of the universe. And he's got some very interesting uh, posts that he puts up on his. He, he's actually got also videos that he puts up. So I listen to those two guys quite often. I find them very entertaining. And then, of course, I like somebody like Joe Rogan and Sam Harris. I listen to them, too. I'm very impressed with those people. So. Have you visited India? <laughs> Anything? No, I would love to, though. I would love to be in, invited out to give a speech. I um, I. I, I I would be dying to come out there. I, I'm, I've got, as I told you, I have several followers out there now and um, trying to build this up and hopefully we can get more people, get another podcast or two from India and generate some interest. So I, I would love to come out. So as soon as any, COVID's over, call me in. I would, I would love to come out. And, uh, any I'd particular come. place you want to visit in India? Any particular? Well, I, I, I'd, I'd want to see the Taj Mahal, of course. I mean, it's a real touristy thing, but uh, I, I would probably want to take a trip up in your mountain areas. I, I, I think be fascinating and then uh some of your big cities mumbai you know would be fun and um you know i'd be my first time i'd be a tourist so i would want to see the touristy things but i want to be wa walked around by a local so i get the local flavor you know that would be great so we can get in touch if you come here <laughs> yeah okay i would like that that would be great appreciate that thank you very much sir. thank you for giving your time precious time yes well thank you for having me i really enjoyed my time with you and it's been fascinating i really appreciate it